Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds today. Uh, today, we are excited to have uh, Dr. Elder Musaltsets from the uh, Division of Addiction Medicine um, speak about like a fentanyl crisis. Uh, let me uh, introduce briefly um, Dr. Edmund Salsitz has been attending physician um, at BI since 1983 and is an associate uh, clinical professor of psychiatry at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. So he is a principal investigator of the Methadone Medical Maintenance Program Research Project and then Dr. Saltzit uh, is certified in medicine, addiction, addiction, addiction medicine by the American Board of Preventive Medicine, as well as uh, ABIM and pulmonary medicine. He has published and lectures frequently on addiction medicine topics. Um, Dr. Saltzit uh, teaches addiction medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai to third year medical students, uh, master of science students, and also neuroscience PhD candidates and also psychiatry residents. He's a frequent contributor and presenter at the Addiction Club led by Dr. Hurd. Mm -hmm. And also Dr. Salsit is a reci like frequent recipient of like um, awards from uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine, including a 2014 uh, ASAM annual awards and also 2018 uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine annual educator of the year award. Uh, today, Dr. Saltzitz will talk about fentanyl crisis. Um, that said, um, Dr. Saltzitz, please take over. Okay, thank you very much, Hiato, for that generous introduction. Very happy to be here in the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Although I, my appointment, my academic appointment is in the Department of Psychiatry, I'm a card-carrying internist. I have no disclosures. So we're going to talk about fentanyl uh, and opioid, and uh, I like to start right at the beginning uh, in terms of opioids. Here's an opium poppy plant or a field of opium poppies growing probably someplace in Afghanistan. Uh, poppy plants have beautiful flowers, red, white, orange. Uh, if any of you have gardens, you have other varieties of, of poppy plants in your garden, not the opium poppy. After a couple of weeks, the flowers fall off and you're left with what's called the unripened seed pod. <clears throat> if you cut into that, let's say with a razor blade, uh, and you squeeze out the contents, you get this kind of milky, grayish, brownish fluid. This is raw opium. And what is in raw opium? A number of very important plant alkaloids, particularly morphine and codeine, also thebane and papaverin. When you prescribe morphine for a patient, the morphine is still coming from legally harvested poppy plants, not synthesized de novo in a, in a laboratory or pharmaceutical company. If you let the seed pod dry out and then you, you shake it a couple of weeks later, you get poppy seeds. When you eat a poppy seed bagel or a poppy seed cake, this is where the poppy seeds are coming from. So depending on the sensitivity of the toxicology test, you can definitely test positive both for morphine and or codeine after eating a poppy seed bagel. So here's morphine on the left, you know, from the poppy, from the opium poppy plant, and it is converted to heroin by putting two acetyl groups on the morphine. So heroin can be called diacetyl morphine. Heroin is actually a semi-synthetic opioid then, and it's also a pro-drug. It doesn't have much opiate agonist activity itself. Why do people prefer heroin over morphine? Because it is more lipophilic. It gets into the brain faster than morphine. And as a general rule in addiction medicine, those drugs that get into the brain faster have a higher addiction potential. However, heroin is rapidly metabolized to an intermediate metabolite called 6-monoacetyl morphine and then converted into morphine. So most of the heroin is detected as morphine when you do a toxicology test. However, if you're able to detect 6-monoacetyl morphine, which would indicate relatively recent heroin use, this is pathognomonic of using heroin. Nothing else is going to give you this metabolite. And these plant alkaloids were all the medications that were available until the modern pharmaceutical industry was developed in, in the 20th century. Uh, and here you have 
Uh, heroin is actually a brand name product of the Bayer Pharmaceutical Company, as is aspirin. Uh, they developed both of these products, but there were heroin tablets, there, were her there was heroin cough medicine. One of the ideas behind the heroin uh, formulations was that people were having trouble with morphine, which was also legal at the time, and they were, be they were becoming what we would call addicted to the morphine. And so Bayer Pharmaceutical said, we have the answer to that, and the answer is going to be heroin. There were heroin lozenges, and this must have been a pretty good throat lozenge, menthol, eucalyptus, and cocaine, taking advantage of cocaine's um, uh, anesthetic uh, properties. So switching um, from, from that little introduction to opioids in general, I, I want to present a case called rapid sudden death after IV drug use. So we have a 26-year-old male, eight-year history of opioid use disorder. He went from prescription opioids to intranasal heroin to IV heroin over the last 12 months. And this is a very common progression that people have made over the last number of years. He's had three non-fatal overdoses over the last eight months, not compliant with his buprenorphine treatment and the psychosocial treatment that went along with it. He was at home. He argued with his mother. He went up to his room. Mother heard a loud thud, found him on the floor, unresponsive, with syringe and needle in his arm, five minutes after the argument. There was some naloxone nasal spray available. Uh, she administered it twice. There was no response. Patient could not be resuscitated by the EMS. And the question is, what happened? And you might think, well, this is a typical opioid-induced respiratory depression where the respiratory rate goes down, the tidal volume goes down, PO2 goes down, PCO2 goes up. The only problem is that this young man died in only a couple of minutes. And the typical opioid respiratory depression overdose death takes much longer than that, usually greater than an hour. And that is why naloxone has become a very effective reversal agent because there's enough time for first responders to administer the, uh, the naloxone. If it was happening that quickly, uh, there would be no way for the naloxone to arrive in time. On the postmortem toxicology of this case, it was positive for fentanyl. So he was using heroin, but it was contaminated with fentanyl. However, he was negative for the primary metabolite of fentanyl called norfentanyl. He was positive for heroin, so the mixture was heroin and fentanyl. He was negative for 6-monoacetylmorphine, which is produced within minutes of heroin administration. He was positive for morphine, reflecting the ongoing heroin use that he had. So what is this? This is a case of fentanyl-induced chest wall rigidity, sometimes called wooden chest. Fentanyl-induced respiratory muscle rigidity, laryngospasm is another way to, to call this phenomenon. And I was not aware of this until, until a few years ago, but this has been reported in the anesthesia literature for many, many years, and anesthesiologists know all about this, where rapid IV administration of fentanyl and any of its analogs can give you the skeletal muscle rigidity, chest wall jaw larynx are most common, so there's kind of a dual mechanism of an overdose. Once this happens, you just can't move air. You can't ventilate in addition to the uh, respiratory depression in, in the medulla. So it's most common with fentanyl, again, because of its lipophilicity, uh, IV administration. There's actually a mechanism. It's very complicated. We'll come back to this a little bit later. It activates the cerulospinal noradrenergic pathway following activation by the fentanyl in the locus ceruleus. So there's a noradrenergic surge that seems to mediate this particular problem. Some articles uh, say it's dose-related, others say not necessarily. It can be reversed with naloxone sometimes. Uh, anesthesiologists often will use uh, a drug like succinylcholine uh, and then intubate the patient if this happens in the, in the OR. In the OR. Um, and one of the ways that you, 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 you have a hint that this is happening is that there is little to no norfentanyl in the, in the, if, the, if the person dies in the postmortem toxicology. So this is now Dayton, Ohio, going back to 2017. 
Ohio was hit very hard by the opioid epidemic, and they reported 100 accidental overdose deaths in the first quarter of 2017. And they had the postmortem toxicologies. In 99%, they found fentanyl. That's the 99% up there. In only three cases, could they find evidence of heroin use, you know, showing that the heroin supply in Dayton had been replaced by fentanyl. But of great interest is that only two thirds of the patients had detectable norfentanyl. And again, norfentanyl is, is you, you can find it within two minutes. It's produced by cytochrome 3A4. So the implication is that these folks died so rapidly, some of them, that they could not produce any norfentanyl. And probably this was the, the wooden chest syndrome. So fentanyl, uh, we're all familiar with fentanyl, many pharmaceutical formulations of fentanyl. I think most of us are, are most familiar with the fentanyl transdermal system uh, used for uh, treatment of chronic pain. And then there are a variety of fentanyl analogs that are used in the, in the OR, like remifentanyl, sufentanyl. Uh, and some of these have been produced so that they have a transmucosal route of administration, like the fentanyl lollipop. This one, there was a lot of controversy about this one called sepsis, which was a, uh, a, a sublingual nasal spray. And many, many physicians got involved in a, in a whole scandal of overprescribing uh, this potent uh, fentanyl product. I want to draw your attention to one of the fentanyl analogs called carfentanyl. You may have heard about this in the news. Uh, this is sometimes called the elephant tranquilizer. It's a, a very potent analog of fentanyl, and it's used in veterinary medicine. But sometimes it finds its way into the illicit drug supply. I'll show you a picture of that in, in a moment. Now, in terms of the terminology with this fentanyl crisis that's been going on for almost 10 years now, we have pharmaceutical fentanyls, which is not the current problem. We have non-pharmaceutical fentanyls or illicitly manufactured fentanyl. Those are synonyms. There, this is coming, this is being synthesized in China and Mexico and then being imported into the United States in a variety of different ways. There's another category called synthetic opioids. So synthetic opioids are fentanyl, methadone, meperidine, but then there are novel synthetic opioids, which could be fentanyl analogs, but could also be other types of opioids that are not related to fentanyl. I'll show you a little more about this, a little more about this in a moment. These, these new compounds called nitazines are becoming more and more popular. Fentanyl, like, like other illicit drugs, has a number of different uh, uh, of street names. So where is this illicit fentanyl coming from? Again, not from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, in the past, there has been a few outbreaks of fentanyl misuse coming from pharmaceutical fentanyl, but not now. Now again, synthesized, not only fentanyl, but all of these analogs and congeners of fentanyl, mostly in China and now also in Mexico. So this is a little bit old. I, I wish there were a more updated slide, but I, I couldn't find one. These are fentanyl prescriptions per 100 persons, 2010 to 2014. Fentanyl became a big problem in 2013. And you can see these are the number of drug overdoses involving fentanyl going up substantially in 2013. And these are DEA drug seizures of fentanyl. And you can see though that it was not related to the number of prescriptions that were prescribed. It was independent of the prescribing line. So the non-pharmaceutical fentanyls, that can be a powder, they can be tablets, liquid. There are many different routes of administration. Generally, people are injecting this, saying that they're using heroin, because the heroin is contaminated with the fentanyl, or they're sniffing it, they're using the intranasal route. Um, I don't know a lot about the dark web, I certainly don't know about cryptocurrency, but uh, the, the, the trading in this, the buying of it is involved with the dark web and the cryptocurrency. Now, again, we've had outbreaks with fentanyl before 2013. In 2006, there was an outbreak, a thousand people overdosed on fentanyl, the DEA found a lab in Mexico that was producing all this fentanyl. It was shut down and the problem went away. 
it was, so it was a different situation than we have today. The reason that was happening back in 2006, they say, is that the purity of the heroin had decreased. And so it was a supply side response to that where the drug dealers were giving people a more potent opioid. Some immunoassays are positive for fentanyl. Sometimes you need confirmation. Come back to the toxicology a little bit later. So here's fentanyl, a molecular formula and structure, acetyl fentanyl, butyryl fentanyl, furanyl fentanyl. These are congeners of fentanyl. And what the chemists do is once something is scheduled, schedule one, they then change the molecule and we have an unscheduled analog again. In addition to the fentanyl problem, there are problems with other opioids. I mentioned that nitazine before. I'm going to show you a little more about that. A compound called U47700. Some are related to morphine. Some are not. They're kind of de novo opioids. Um, and you can see here, this, this is drug seizures uh, by the DEA. Uh, in 2011, let's say fentanyl 671 goes up to 28,000 in five-year period of time. And here's one of the, conge the congeners, uh, acetyl fentanyl, dramatic increase, furanyl fentanyl. So a lot of evidence to show this increased use and increased production of the fentanyls. Uh, and these kinds of articles come out, I would say, weekly. New opioids more powerful than fentanyl are discovered in D.C. amid a deadly wave of overdoses. And this had to do with protonitazine which they say now is 200-fold more potent than morphine. Fentanyl is 100-fold more potent. And then these reports from, these, from a monitoring agency called the Center for Forensic Science Research and Education, they followed up with their own little brief um, primer on protonitazine, giving you some of the facts about it, where it's been found. And again, not a big problem so far, but spreading gradually across the country. And here they're saying it's three times more potent than fentanyl. And I would say every week a, a new alert comes out about somebody synthesizing a new, a new form of an opioid. The, um, the whole opioid overdose epidemic has really been three epidemics, th three sub-epidemics, and now maybe a fourth wave as well. The first epidemic I know you're all familiar with, it was the prescription opioid epidemic. And that took place in the 90s, the 2000s, and it has leveled off, which, which I'll show you on the next slide. It has leveled off uh, over the last couple of years. When, when prescribing of the prescription opioids became more of a problem and prescribing went down, what happened was that heroin was easily available and cheaper. Heroin became cheaper than buying an illicit oxycodone pill, and so we had this dramatic rise in heroin overdose deaths starting in 2010. And of course, the worst part about the opioid epidemic is what we're in now, the fentanyl. And that started in 2013, and we'll talk a little bit about why that, why that happened and, and how it's an ongoing problem. And the other new, the new change that's happening, according to the epidemiologists, is a significant increase in stimulant overdose deaths, methamphetamine and cocaine. So bringing the data a little bit more up to date, here's the prescription opioid line going down. Here's the heroin line also going down. And then, of course, the fentanyl line is inexorably going up. Despite all maneuvers to try to solve this problem, the overdose death rate keeps increasing. And here's the uh, cocaine and methamphetamine going up. On the next slide, we're looking at the same data, but now we're looking at with involvement of fentanyl and without involvement. And so with involvement, the prescription opioids and the heroin, the lines seem to be going up or leveling off, methamphetamine going up, cocaine going up in conjunction with fentanyl. But if you take the fentanyl out, the prescription opioid death rate is going down significantly, heroin, cocaine. Methamphetamine is, is itself a very toxic substance and doesn't seem to be affected uh, as much whether there is fentanyl co-involvement or not. <clears throat> so this is the most recent data 
This is data that ends in April of April 2021, you know, from April 2020 to April 2021. Now, for the first time, over 100,000 overdose deaths. This has never happened in the United States before. 75,000 of them are opioid related deaths and others are a mixture of other drugs. Uh, and the synthetic opioids you can see make up almost all of the opioid overdose deaths in that 12 month period ending in 2021. And um, a couple of years ago, there was a slight dip in the, in the total. And then next year it went up and it went up again. This is New York City now that we're looking at. And uh, this is the first quarter, this is up to the first quarter of 2021. And it's reporting 596 overdose deaths in the first quarter of 2021. But you can see in the, in the last number, this was 2019, I guess this was through the COVID crisis and overdose deaths and problems with, with addiction have increased overall during, during COVID. Um, let's see, is this animated? Yeah, so that, that, that's the, you know, the latest data up to quarter one. 75% of the overdose deaths are fentanyl involved. The hot spots in our city are areas of Harlem and areas in the Bronx. There's always been a hot spot here in Staten Island. Um, so we are, we like the rest of the country are involved in this fentanyl overdose uh, death problem. And um, yeah, I'm sure that you follow reports in the media. Um, you know, many non-famous people die, but here's a guy named Michael Williams, uh, a noted actor who died only a couple of months ago. But remember, we were talking about all those different fentanyl analogs, and here they find them on the postmortem: fentanyl, fluorofentanyl, heroin, and cocaine. So what you read about in the in the academic papers is really true in real life. So. If morphine is one in terms of potency at the opioid receptor, heroin is twice as potent, fentanyl 100 times more potent, and carfentanyl 10,000 times more potent than morphine. This is supposed to be the amount of heroin that would be fatal to an average adult, the amount of fentanyl, and then one or two grains of carfentanyl is enough to kill uh, an adult. What's interesting is that Fentanyl and carfentanyl both have pharmaceutical products, pharmaceutical formulations, which are approved. So they're both Schedule II substances, whereas heroin is a Schedule I. So um, it's paradoxical that it would probably be less of a criminal justice problem with carfentanyl than there would be with, with heroin. I, I wanted to show you uh, the immunoassay test that we have now in our hospital. It's actually very, very good, and it has a, a number of analytes that we didn't used to have. So this represents a, a UTOX, an admitting u, u, urinary toxicology on a 40-year-old man who was on methadone 80 milligrams a day, and he came in for benzodiazepine and heroin use. And this was his, uh, his admitting UTOX, and you can see that he's positive for benzodiazepines, now, a caution here is that on our immunoassay screen, clonazepam will generally not come out positive. So this is more likely to be alprazolam, lorazepam, or diazepam. He's also positive for the metabolite of methadon and for the parent compound of methadon, meaning that somebody took methadon and it was metabolized to its inactive metabolite. But he's also positive for fentanyl, you know, using heroin, but positive for fentanyl. And I would say these days, 99% of our patients who come in, say, I'm using heroin, are positive for fentanyl. Sometimes there's evidence of heroin use as well, but often it's just fentanyl. But in this case, there was evidence of heroin use. He was positive for opiate, A-T-E, as opposed to opioid. And this represents either morphine or codeine. But he was also positive for that metabolite, 6-acetylmorphine. So this is pathognomonic use of heroin, you know, along with the fentanyl that he may or may not have known was in the illicit drugs that he was buying. So our urine toxins are really good right now, and they can help, they can help sort of put together a case sometimes. Um, in addition to all the fentanyl, 
which is contaminating or replacing heroin, we have bigger problems. And that is that fentanyl is now contaminating cocaine, where presumably cocaine addicted people have no opioid tolerance. People are buying hydrocodone or oxycodone. They're actually fentanyl. People are buying alprazolam. Again, real fake fentanyl. Um, there was a uh, there was an outbreak of in Connecticut where people think marijuana was contaminated with fentanyl. There are other reports that doubt that this is true, but in any case, uh, that they found uh, evidence of fentanyl in people who were only using marijuana. And there was an outbreak of a cocaine laced with fentanyl on Long Island a couple of months ago. Six people died. The DEA put out a warning about pills, and they're saying that more than 9.5 million counterfeit pills have been seized so far. Most common uh, fake pills are oxycodone, hydrocodone, alprazolam, and also the stimulants like, like, um, the, like amphetamines, widely available, and people can just get them by, by clicking on a site on a smartphone, including minors. Um, and here's a real oxycodone 30 milligram. Here's a fake. And so they look very, very much like the real thing. And you can buy pill presses, apparently, online. Here's a pill press you can buy, I think it's on eBay, for $7,500. And you can get molds. The Xanax, opioid, Adderall are unspecified. So a lot of crazy things are going on. Uh, and um, people keep trying to stay one step ahead of it. This is now looking at, um, at the rate of fentanyl positivity in people who are saying they're using cocaine and methamphetamine on the urine drug toxicology. This is the cocaine line, methamphetamine line. So you can see that since 2013, there's increasing contamination of cocaine and methamphetamine with fentanyl. Uh, this was a case in the Bronx a couple of years ago where this amount of fentanyl was wrapped up in tilapia f uh, f um, fish. And it, the, the, the police said, that it had, it was worth $10 million, 1 million lethal doses. So one of the problems with fentanyl as opposed to heroin is that you, you can have a lot of it in a very small volume because it's so potent. So from the drug dealer's point of view, it is much easier and more profitable to be dealing with fentanyl than it is with heroin, not to mention the fact that you don't have to grow the plant and harvest the, the crop. Um, there was another uh, issue that some of you may have been aware of, and that was early in the fentanyl epidemic, first responders thought that they would, would overdose by getting a little fentanyl on their skin or on their clothing or maybe inhaling a little bit. And um, overall, that turned out not to be true. Uh, and in this study, they went over the reports and they pointed out why it wasn't true. So fentanyl is a huge problem, but the thing with the first responders didn't turn out to be uh, scientifically correct. So fentanyl neuroscience, one of the rules I've, I've been lecturing for a long time, one of my uh, ironclad rules is never try to explain what you don't understand. But I'm going to violate that rule today, and I'm going to try to explain a little bit about the fentanyl neuroscience, which is uh, very, very complicated. So <clears throat> there's something called a biased agonist, where a, a ligand hooks up to the receptor, attaches to the receptor, and it can activate it in a number of different ways. So with morphine, morphine activates the mu opioid receptor through G-protein coupled activation. And it's an inhibitory G-protein. And so when people take morphine, which you know is heroin, it inhibits the cell and the downward cascade and the kinases, et cetera. However, there's another pathway which fentanyl uses, and that is this beta arrestin pathway which is G protein independent. And in that pathway, you get more respiratory depression than analgesia from the activation of the receptor. And so fentanyl is called a biased agonist at the mu receptor because it enlists the beta arrestin pathway. The way this looks from a more scientific point of view is here's the mu opioid receptor, the ligand would, would attach to the receptor, and you can have G-protein dependent signaling, or you can have G-protein independent signaling. This is the pathway that fentanyl takes, leading to more, a uh, higher rate of respiratory depression. 
if you give enough morphine, it eventually recruits this G protein independent pathway as well. But at clinically, clinically used doses, it stays on this side of, of, the, of the equation. So that's the first thing that's different about fentanyl than let's say morphine and oxycodone is this biased agonism resulting in greater risk for respiratory depression. Here's a very, very interesting study. Heroin contaminated with fentanyl dramatically enhances brain hypoxia and induces brain hypothermia. So this is a study done in freely moving rats. Some sort of electrochemical electrode is implanted into a, their brains, looking at a part of the brain dealing with addiction called the nucleus accumbens. The rats are then given either heroin alone or heroin and fentanyl, 10% fentanyl mixed into the heroin. In, in both cases, they get a significant drop in their oxygenation levels to about the same nadir level. However, the recovery from that drop in oxygenation is relatively rapid in the heroin-only rats, whereas it is much more prolonged in the heroin-fentanyl rats. Exactly why this is, is not explained clearly in the paper, but they use the term potentiation. This is still the same study, and now this is just fentanyl, which also causes about the same level of drop, but has a very rapid recovery. And here's the delayed recovery again. So it seems that when you mix heroin and fentanyl, maybe because now you're getting the effect of, of morphine as an unbiased agonist, fentanyl as a biased agonist, but however, however the mechanism works, there is a longer period of, 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 uh, of, of, of lower oxygen that, that, that persists for a longer period of time with the combination rather than with each drug alone. Which brings us to naloxone or overdose uh, reversal. And so you all know about naloxone. Uh, this has become the most popular formulation, the four milligram nasal spray usually uh, administered once or twice. Uh, the other products I, I just won't go into. Uh, I thought this was a, an interesting you know, picture, teaching children how to reverse an overdose. I mean, when did you ever think this would happen? And one of the untold stories of the opioid epidemic is the number of children that have been left as, as, as orphans, losing their parents uh, due to overdoses. And uh, so here you have little kids, says teaching children as young as six how to administer Naloxone. So, moving on to a study with naloxone. This is uh, this is something that I don't really understand. This is this is using a technique called quantitative systems pharmacology. This is some sort of an in vivo technique where they're going to model what a fentanyl overdose is like and how much naloxone is necessary to reverse that overdose. Of great importance is that this was a pharmaceutical funded study, Atomus Pharmaceuticals. And what they did through this mechanism, uh, well, first, first they laid out some ground rules and they said, in order to survive a, a fentanyl overdose, you have to get to less than 50% of mu receptor occupancy by fentanyl if you wanna survive. They also said that the intranasal naloxone was only about 45% bioavailability, bioavailable, intramuscular 100%. Respiratory depression within minutes of fentanyl exposure, we've been through that, and brain damage within six minutes. So they're saying that the clock starts and you've got to be able to reverse it, get to less than 50% occupancy within six minutes. So that's the goal of treating an opioid overdose with naloxone. And so they looked at a lower dose typically used in surgery, might be loss of consciousness. The yellow dotted line represents the percent of receptors occupied by fentanyl. And at that dose, 75% are occupied. This, this black dotted line is the 50% occupancy. And you can see they, they looked at two milligrams, five and 10 of IM naloxone. And they all did well prior to the six minute cutoff. 
when they looked at a little bit of a higher dose of fentanyl, 50 milligrams, which might be you know, typical for a street overdose, the two milligram naloxone at six minutes did not get to 50% occupancy. And this would be equal to, let's say, the four milligram nasal spray, whereas the five and 10 uh, did get to that, to that 50%. When they looked at a heavier or, or a more potent overdose, 75 nanograms per ml, they found that, again, the two milligram was not adequate. The five milligram just about made it, the 10 milligram made it. And so based on, I think, this data, um, oh, no, I've got to do one more thing before that. Now, that would suggest that the four milligram nasal spray that we have available now and, and using two doses of it, let's say, uh, would not be adequate to reverse a, a fentanyl overdose. However, these three papers came out very recently and they they went against that and they said that even though the fentanyl is more potent, we're using about the same amount of naloxone. The dose of naloxone administered for overdose reversal was not associated with the measured fentanyl concentration. There were no significant differences in the doses of naloxone. And in, in one article, they showed that whether it was opiates alone or fentanyl involved, the doses of naloxone were relatively similar. So that counters that pharmaceutical study. Nevertheless, the FDA has recently approved a eight milligram nasal spray called Cloxato. And this is the company that did the, the study with the IM, IM naloxone, and they approved their product called Zimhi with the five milligrams of naloxone, which seemed to be able to get to that 50% occupancy. So getting back to the chest wall rigidity for just a moment, uh, again, people have known about this for a long time. It's nothing new except to me and other people who are not, you know, anesthesiologists. Um, and then there was this paper, again, this is a very detailed paper, 22 pages going over the purported mechanisms of the cerulospinal tract resulting in respiratory muscle rigidity and paralysis, both in animals and in, and in humans. Uh, and I don't, have, I don't want to spend much time here because uh, I'm, I'm coming close to the end, but this is a definite entity. And I do think it's one of the reasons why, despite widespread use of naloxone prevention, it, it's not able in some cases to reverse the wooden chest syndrome. Uh, sometimes you'd need a different medication like the neuromuscular blockade medication. So just a wooden chest with fentanyl. So fentanyl is highly lipophilic. That's one of its main attributes. Um, it equilibrates rapidly between the plasma and the CNF, five minutes rapid onset of action. It has a relatively short duration of action because as, as, as quickly as it gets into the central nervous system, it also starts to leave the central nervous system and it distributes itself to muscle and fat tissue. So it's, it's in quickly with a big bang and it's out quickly as well. Elimination half-life about three to four hours. With prolonged use, fentanyl becomes a longer acting drug. We think of it as short acting, but with regular use, it becomes long acting. I'll show you that in a moment. Hepatic metabolism, some of the cytochrome enzymes, Main metabolite is norfentanyl. All metabolites are inactive. Uh, and like with most things, decreased clearance in the elderly. Physicians. So anesthesiologists have always been at the top of the list of physicians who become addicted to substances. And in this paper, which actually comes from Mount Sinai uh, a while ago, 2008, fentanyl and sufentanyl, in terms of anesthesiologists, topped the list of drugs that the anesthesiologists became addicted to. And in this study, they looked at, they looked at uh, the presence of fentanyl in the air and on different surfaces in the OR. Because one of the theories is that the fentanyl that, that's given to the patient is exhaled to some extent and is in the air, and the anesthesiologist becomes sensitized over time to that fentanyl, and that creates a vulnerability. So they found fentanyl on operating room walls, metallic surfaces, shops boxes, the anesthesiologist cart. 
And this is, you know, one of the theories controversial that leads anesthesiologists to have this higher rate of addiction. Um, now, this again is from Sinai uh, a while ago, 1993, where they were trying to figure out, can we do urinary drug tests for fentanyl to see if our doctors are becoming addicted to it? And what, what they did, they, they looked at some patients who were given fentanyl, and they measured fentanyl nor fentanyl. And they found by 24 hours, you could hardly detect any fentanyl, although you could detect nor fentanyl. And they concluded that because it's, it, it leaves the body so quickly, it's not going to be a great tool to monitor the anesthesiology staff. So a big new development with this paper in 2020. They looked at 12 people admitted to an inpatient rehab who tested positive for fentanyl when they were admitted. Uh, that's a locked unit. Every few days, they did another urine drug test on them. And they were able to find fentanyl up to roughly three weeks and nor fentanyl up to four weeks. So this is a surprise because most people think fentanyl is short acting in and out quickly, which it is with single doses. But when people are using heroin, which is really fentanyl, and they're doing it a few times a day, the fentanyl builds up in the fatty tissues. And we ourselves have been able to document fentanyl uh, in the urine up to four weeks after a person was admitted. That, that's a, a, a new way of looking at, at, at fentanyl. Um, there are also false positive results on the immunoassay. The, the number one drug is trazodone, which can cause a false positive, risperidone and some of its uh, cousins. Surprisingly to me, not norfentanyl. So here was a woman who came in uh, on 911 for alcohol and benzo use disorders, and trazodone was started on 915. So 911, when she came in, she had a positive result for benzodiazepine on the urine tox. We repeated the test on 927 after she'd been on trazodone for a couple of weeks, and the benzos were positive because we used that to detox from alcohol. And here is fentanyl positive now. You know, a woman was in an in inpatient all that time. So the question is, is this a false positive or did she somehow get her hands on fentanyl? So we sent it out for what's called a confirmatory test, GCMS, and the fentanyl was negative. That means this is a false positive for fentanyl, probably caused by the trazodone. Um, this whole thing with fentanyl has a lot of economic uh, literature about it. This is very, very profitable for the drug dealers. Heroin costs about $65,000 wholesale a kilogram, fentanyl 3,500, 20 to 1 ratio. However, the sellers are still selling the product at the heroin price. So this fentanyl epidemic that we're in is considered to be a supply-led epidemic. Users are not asking for fentanyl. Most of them would rather just have heroin because it has that smoother uh, duration of action with the fentanyl is in out. Um, and so this is all being led by high, high up in the cartels, high up in the drug supply. The street dealer, street supplier probably has no idea anymore what's in the drugs that, that he or she is selling. Um, what are people saying? They're saying it's an intense high, however, it's very short lived, it hits you like a Mack truck. They like the combo of fentanyl and heroin, you get the big hit and then it stays longer. Most people are not seeking fentanyl, and most people think they know what they're using. Uh, anybody buying any illicit drugs, opiates, non-opioids, should assume that it's either replaced with fentanyl or contaminated with fentanyl. Here's an interesting study in an ED in Massachusetts. 30 patients come in after a heroin overdose requiring an naloxone. They do extensive urine drug testing on them. 30 people report they used heroin, turned out to be true in 28 patients. However, only 16 said, I think I used fentanyl, was present in 29 cases. So only 55% of people could detect the fentanyl. With cocaine, surprising, only 60% thought it was cocaine and it was much higher level. So people have no idea, most people have no idea what they're actually taking. Um, harm reduction with this fentanyl is very, very important. Some people can look or taste it and think they can tell with that. Always start with a low dose because you don't know the potency. 
never do it alone so somebody can do naloxone reversal and there's a question mark do we need higher doses of naloxone or is that going to result in more precipitated withdrawal and angrier patients mixing other drugs along with the fentanyl of course increases the risk of overdose there are now point of care fentanyl strips so i think you'll see that on the next slide here's a big one safe injection sites uh, has worked really well in canada and a few other countries and de blasio opened up two of them last week uh, so it just sort of happened overnight and they definitely have evidence of effectiveness and if people are using other drugs maybe we should offer them naltrexone the opiate blocker because of the fentanyl contamination so you can give patients these test strips they can they can put some of the powder in in water and dissolve it and then they can see if fentanyl is present or not and then hopefully make some decisions based on that and here are the uh, safe injection sites two of them opened up uh, it's really a big deal there's a there's good evidence to show that they um, result in decreased deaths increased uh, increased utilization of medical services increased utilization of more definitive treatment i believe that we're the only in the open uh, safe injection sites in the country right now other cities have tried but they've been closed down it's against federal law to do this um, so I think that fentanyl comes with a triple overdose threat you get that typical respiratory depression you get that biased agonism that study with the hypoxemia uh, staying staying for a prolonged period of time and of course the wooden chest which I think is a much bigger deal than people recognize Fentanyl has had a very negative impact on addiction treatment, should be included in all drug toxicology tests. Think of it as long acting. We're getting in increased precipitated withdrawals when we try to do an induction with buprenorphine because the fentanyl, unbeknownst to us, is still in the system. And we have a precipitated withdrawal, just like what I'm talking about going on right now on 5B, uh, our, our detox unit where there's probably a persistence of fentanyl uh, and, and the, uh, the patient's having precipitated withdrawal after two milligrams of buprenorphine. The diverted buprenorphine that's out there is actually a harm reduction modality, but the patients who are using it are having the same trouble we're having, and that is they're developing precipitated withdrawal, which is decreasing their desire to be on formal buprenorphine treatment people are injecting more because it's so short acting heroin is not covering the withdrawal from fentanyl because it's not really it's not cross tolerant enough and this is the big one when people are on adequate doses of methadone and buprenorphine maintenance they used to have something that was called narcotic blockade where they didn't feel the illicit opioid but now with the fentanyl they're feeling it despite being on doses of methadone of 200 or 250 milligrams and 24 milligrams of buprenorphine. And you just can't keep increasing those doses because then you get its own, its own set of side effects. So nobody knows what to do about it. It's also overcoming the, the naltrexone blockade when naltrexone is given uh, IM every four weeks. And some people say give it every three weeks. And people are turning to other medications or supplements or herbal preparations like kratom, tyaneptine, et cetera, uh, because uh, they're just not able to manage this whole thing with the fentanyl. Um, and that is it. And I think I left enough time for uh, any, any comments or questions and answers. Thank you so much, Dr. Salford. Great talk. Um, yeah, I didn't know that about, like, I didn't know anything about like fentanyl just for resiliency. Yeah. But um, I might have like uh, those kind of uh, patients in the medical ICU uh, who died after like um, drug overdose. Any uh, questions from the audience? Um, yeah, I mean, I tried to cover it very, very broadly. I left out a couple of things here and there, but um, uh, that's the basics. Where do, you, where do you see the trend in the use of fentanyl? Oh, I lost that. Where do you see the trend in the use of fentanyl and remedies in the immediate future? You see an end solution. I, I really don't because um, despite massive increases in buprenorphine prescribing, 
It's been such an effort to get providers wavered, including PAs and NPs. And there is a lot more buprenorphine being prescribed, and there's a lot more naloxone being distributed. These overdoses continue to go up. Um, and I, I don't know, I don't know what the answer is except more more treatment, more communication. Many people sort of drop out of treatment very, very quickly after they start. Um, yeah, I don't know. Ed, I, I just want to say thanks. I always learn so much when I hear you speak. It's just such practical and interesting pearls. Um, so just to go back to a point that you made and, and summed up with about the naloxone kits, like so the New York City naloxone kit, you know, that what you get from the free giveaways and in the pharmacy or whatever in that in that bag. I have one myself. It's too right, it's two um it's two nasal syringes for right, exactly I have one of those, right? I got it in Bernstein. Beth, Beth sign I was doing like a little on the spot yeah. training and a giveaway in conjunction yeah. with the city a few months ago. So I got one. So that's two uh four milligram nasal injections. So are you saying that both of those doses used, you know, one after another may not be enough to to reverse even partially like the typical fentanyl, you know, overdose on the street these days? So this has become a little bit controversial. Um, some of the data would suggest that but most of the data would suggest no, you can still probably reverse most overdoses with the two four milligram nasal sprays. Mm. There's also a big difference, I think, between managing an overdose by, by let's say, on the street, just a, a regular layperson, first responder, and in the ED. Because the goal is to try to reverse the respiratory depression without putting the person into precipitated withdrawal. That's not easy to do on the street or in an ambulance. But once you have an IV in, you have O2 monitoring, and you're in the ED, you can just gradually titrate and give a little bit more, let's say, IV naloxone. So I, I thought when I first read that pharma, pharmaceutical study that it all made a lot of sense, and they got approval for an 8-milligram formulation. And now I'm a little bit uh, cynical and skeptical about how that all worked based on those three other good academic papers showing, hey, you know, we're still doing okay. It's interesting, you know, in the training and the naloxone, you know, training for an overdose, they tell you before you give it, you know, put your gloves on, your mask, get down and yell into the person's ear, I am going to give you Narcan because everybody knows that that's not going to be pleasant. So the idea, I guess, is if they if they're at all sort of just, you know, you know, not not responding because they don't feel like it. That in, that instruction will will help them wake up to the best of their possible ability because they don't want the Narcan. Right, and the other thing is to call nine one one. Yeah. Uh, let me let me thank Dahlia for the kind words. Thank you, Dahlia. Always a pleasure to work with you. I agree with Dan. We always le learn a ton, and I feel like uh, this time on service, more than ever, um, there were a ton of substance use disorder patients with combinations of drugs. I did have a question as to like substances that don't come up on the talk screen because it seemed like there were people that were acting strangely and things weren't turning up positive. So I know there were K2 in the past, PC, I don't know what yeah. other tips. No, I mean, you're right. The synthetic cannabinoids like K2, they don't, they don't, they don't test positive on the immunoassay. I'm working on a talk now on GHB, gamma hydroxybutyrate, and that's really a tough one. That doesn't test positive in and out very, very quickly. But what I, what I would say to the uh, medicine department is anybody coming in uh, with any sort of a, a, an addiction issue, just do a baseline utox on them. You never know that it might be helpful. And um, and this issue of the trazodone false positive, I find that very interesting because we use trazodone a lot, and it's just interesting to be able to make a diagnosis of a false positive that way. And the other thing I, I would tell you to do just for fun, quote unquote fun, is when somebody does come in using heroin and they're positive for fentanyl, repeat it in a couple of days 
and see for yourself how long it can stay positive. I don't know if you remember, Dahlia, we had the case on medicine where we documented 28 days. And I, and I initially thought that he was using, that he brought drugs in and he was using it because I didn't realize it could be detected that long. Thank you. I have a question related to Utox actually. Um, like um, if so, Utox is negative, um, like is it worth repeating the test like in a couple of days during hospitalization? Uh, like uh, how, how possible like uh, is like false negative possible like um a false negative is possible in the sense that the drug is there but it's below the detection ability on the immunoassay so let's say that you thought for sure the person was using fentanyl and the fentanyl was negative you could send that for a con for a confirmatory test it's called GCMS, gas chromatography mass spectroscopy. And you might be able to find it on the con confirmatory tests because it has a, it goes down to a lower, it can detect things at a lower level than the immunoassay. Mm. So if, if you were, you know, if you thought for sure, I think that there is a benzo here, even though it's not coming up, you could send it for confirmation. And that's a good thing to do. Got it. Thank you so much. All right. Oh, there's a comment uh, from Dr. Steinberg. As a Canadian, I will also just uh, defend the poppy as important in that there are wanna on Remembrance Day to honor war veterans in many countries yeah. across the Commonwealth. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm familiar with that. Also, as a Canadian, Dan, you can be very very proud that they've been way ahead of us in terms of harm reduction. Uh, they have the number one safe injection site with good literature that came out of there. Good to know. Good to hear. All right. Thank you so much. Um, if we have uh, additional, if we don't have any additional questions, I think uh, um, let's call it a day. Pleasure to be back home in the Department of Medicine. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Dr. Salsis, for this amazing talk today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye, Dan.